Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Prince, and I'm the director of the Keck Institute for Space Studies, who is uh, the sponsor for tonight's uh, uh, talk. I think it'll be a very interesting evening, uh, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it immensely. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the WM Keck Foundation, okay, who is the very generous sponsor of the Keck Institute. Uh, we are in our seventh of eight years, and uh, we have really benefited from the very generous support of that institution. Uh, I'd also like to thank especially Michelle Judd, who is our managing director. I don't know where she is. She right there. Okay. Uh, for, for all of you who have attended uh, uh, lectures or events uh, put on by the Keck Institute, there is one person who is always primarily responsible for those events and uh, your enjoyment in those events, and that's Michelle. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you are new to the Keck Institute, but the Keck Institute uh, is essentially a think tank for new ideas uh, for space missions, for space science, for space technology, and for space engineering. Uh, typically, what we do is we convene uh, 24, two dozen to 30 experts from uh, all over the country, all over the world, uh, to uh, think about a given problem and to try to come up with new and uh, groundbreaking and revolutionary new ideas for approaches uh, to that problem. Uh, this week's program, and often we have our lectures associated with uh, a program. This week's program is about near-Earth objects, and in particular, uh, surveying the population of near-Earth objects, finding out about all sizes from uh, this size up to kilometer size, which are uh, very dangerous. Sometimes they're called potentially hazardous asteroids. Uh, uh, and uh, to assay those, uh, those asteroids, to get a full idea about the population of them, and then to see about their uses in resource utilization for future space missions, uh, for human visitations to those asteroids, for the basic science uh, uh, that, they, uh, that they have intrinsically, and also eventually for the uh, idea of planetary protection. Uh, I'd like to introduce our two of our leaders for the current program on uh, near-Earth objects, and one is uh, Carol Raymond from JPL. Uh, Carol, can you just uh, wave? Uh, so she's one of the uh, program. And, and then Professor, Professor Bethany Ailman of uh, Cal Caltech campus. And Bethany, are you around? Okay. And then my last job is to introduce the third uh, leader of our program. We always have three. We have one from the Caltech campus, one from JPL, and one external lead. And I would like to, it's my pleasure to introduce our external lead, and that's uh, Joel Sursell, and he will introduce them tonight's speaker. So, Joel. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you so much for the Keck, Keck Institute for doing this study. And and having Stan here, and also to my co-leads, it's a real honor to do this with you, and all the people from the study. Welcome everybody today. It is, and one other organization that deserves thanks today is the Planetary Society, which is a co-sponsor of tonight's uh, talk. So, is Lou Friedman here? So we're really delighted that the Planetary Society is, is with us today and, and helped co-sponsor this. So, when you teach at Caltech, one of the real delights is the amazing students you get to meet. In 1996, I was teaching class on spacecraft and mission design, and uh, uh, one of the amazing students uh, was a remarkable young man who showed up early for class, stayed late, asked the most penetrating questions. I, could, I just couldn't believe the questions. Got an, made an A-plus in the class look like effortless. And this is a tough class, and ask anyone who took my class. And um, what I was surprised to find out about the man is that he was taking it as um, an audit, as a postdoc. <laughs> so he was the OK Earl postdoctoral fellow doing research in asteroid dynamics and hypervelocity impacts. Just a remarkable young man. And, um, 
It was a real pleasure working with him in my class. And we were lucky enough, after he finished his postdoc at Caltech, to recruit him at JPL, where he worked as a spacecraft engineer. And uh, unfortunately, we were not able to retain him at JPL for very long, because in 1998, he was selected as an astronaut candidate, went through the candidacy, went through the training process, and uh, for a year, became an astronaut. And in 2008, he flew on STS-122 to the space station, did two spacewalks, spent 15 hours in EVA time. So this is a guy who, if you want to get a review of the movie Gravity, <laughs> let me tell you, after I saw Gravity, the first thing I did was call him up and say, how good, how real was it? And I'm, and, and, uh, and he said the special effects were fantastic, but you don't do what George Clooney did in a spacesuit. <laughs> so, um, so he's a remarkable scientist, a remarkable individual, an amazing human being. And he's not just a technical geek. This is a guy who's a fourth degree black belt in Taekwondo. Um, and how many Star Trek fans do we have here tonight? Okay. So, so, you've all heard of the tractor beam, okay? One of the things that I hope Stan will talk to you a little bit about tonight is the fact that he is actually the co-inventor of a real tractor beam. It's one of the subjects of our workshop this week, is uh, how to deflect asteroids. So, um, we're not gonna give away, I won't give the secret away of how, I'm hoping to hear about it from you. So, um, he's also been to Antarctica. So you have a fourth degree black belt, EVA walking, former Caltech, JPL. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to the amazing Dr. Stan Love. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, now, I've been wired with this microphone. I'm not sure if they've got it working. Can you everybody hear in the back? Okay. Um, so thank you for, for that wonderful introduction. I'm not nearly that good. Um, so it's wonderful to be back in Southern California. Uh, I went to college at, up the road at Harvey Mudd. I know we shouldn't say that here. Um, had two wonderful years working here at Caltech. But Southern California audiences are always a little bit um, unnerving for me. Uh, first of all, being at Caltech, um, giving a public talk normally most of the people in the audience don't really know very much about space. So if I make a mistake, it's no big deal. <laughs> but this is Caltech, and it's not just Caltech. We have 30 of the finest minds in asteroid science, engineering, and technology in the entire world here in the second and third row, well within <laughs> range of thrown objects. So uh, if I get anything wrong, I will certainly hear about it, but I'm going to use them as my call a friend if somebody asks me a really tough question at the end. <laughs> The other strange thing about Southern California, this is a story um, from several years back. I was giving a talk up at JPL, and I was staying in a hotel down here in town, downtown Pasadena, and I was checking out of the hotel wearing my blue flight suit with all the NASA patches on it, the one that makes little kids very frightened of me when normally they wouldn't be. And I'm checking out of the hotel, and this woman comes up to me and looks at, at this uniform and says, are they filming a movie here? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm a real astronaut. And she goes, oh. <laughs> All right. So it's an interesting place. So uh, let's go on with the talk. I have a lot of road to cover, and hopefully we'll get through it all. Let's see if our clicker's working today. There we go. Uh, you've seen the title. That's you guys and the date and me. And let's get started. OK, so asteroids. Uh, starting at a very basic level. Um, if you grow up in the United States, you hear a few things about asteroids as you're, as you're going through life. You might realize that an asteroid is the home of the little prince. This, by the way, is a very wise book. If you haven't read it, read it. If you haven't read it in the last 10 years, read it again. Really good stuff. Uh, the little prince is from asteroid B612, uh, a letter and number you may hear of later in the evening. Uh, if you've seen the right kinds of movies, you know that asteroids make a great place for a space dogfight. They make good obstacles. You can hide behind them. You can run into them and the bad guys blow up and that sort of good stuff. So you learn about that about asteroids. And as you go through schooling, you might hear that asteroid is credited with wiping out the dinosaurs and sort of clearing off the, uh, the ecological slate on Earth for mammals such as us. 
But that brings up a new question, you know, we rule the world now the way the dinosaurs used to. Could we be in for a similar fate? And that's an interesting question which can lead to movies that can be, <laughs> that can be very exciting or funny, depending. Uh, if you're interested in science and technology, you may also be aware that um, NASA is considering missions where we might send people to go explore a near-Earth asteroid. So we've already been to the moon, Mars is still pretty hard, maybe we could go to an asteroid instead. And there's also, just in the last few years, uh, serious uh, consideration floated towards mining asteroids for the resources that they contain. Uh, actually getting and making stuff out in space rather than getting and making stuff on Earth and throwing it out into space to explore it. So, uh, with that background, let's go into a little more detail on near-Earth asteroids. First I'll talk for a little while about what an asteroid is, we'll talk about the impact hazard and what we might do about it, discuss human missions to asteroids, and then finally talk about the kinds of science that we can do on asteroids that makes them interesting to scientists and also that make them interesting to industrialists. So without further ado, what is an asteroid? Since a picture's worth a thousand words, I don't have extra time, we're going to use a picture. Asteroids are little worlds. They circle the sun like planets, and there are a lot of them, and most of them are pretty small. These sizes may be the size of a county, maybe the size of a city, maybe the size of a stadium. They don't have atmosphere, they're too small to support an atmosphere. All of them are covered with craters, they are the products of impacts. The asteroid belt is grinding itself down to dust just about as fast as it can. Asteroids do collide with one another quite a bit and everything we see has just been pummeled by impacts. Down in the corner here, by the way, we have a couple of comets just for good measure. You can see that uh, the sharp dividing line between the two might be hard to draw. They look kind of similar. Now when I was in school we got a nice simple picture of what asteroids are in the solar system. You have the nice big planets going around the sun and then there's a big gap between Mars and Jupiter and they looked in there and they found little bits of things orbiting the sun and they were all nicely confined to the asteroid belt and then we also found that there were little clumps of asteroids that follow track with Jupiter around the sun orbiting these Lagrange points 60 degrees ahead and behind Jupiter in its orbit but tracking along with the planet. Um, sadly, in this day and age, we have gotten much smarter and seen <laughs> that the picture has become rather complicated. So this is the inner solar system with the orbits of the four inner planets, the orbit of the Earth here in light blue, and every single one of these green dots is an asteroid uh, that orbits far enough from the sun that we don't have to worry about it in terms of an impact hazard on Earth. The reds and the yellows are things that uh, either cross the orbit of the Earth or approach the orbit of the Earth and might potentially be dangerous. Now I hate diagrams like this because every single one you see will have a nice uh, circle or ellipse drawn for each of the orbit of the planets, but each of these dots should have its own ellipse. So the picture would just be a, a scribble completely covered with asteroid tracks if they drew them that way, which is why they don't. But it still gives you the impression that the planets go on these nice little paths and the asteroids are just sort of sprinkled out there like cake decorations. <laughs> now if you've watched the right kinds of movies, you might think that uh, the asteroid belt is really thick with asteroids. And if you were out in there and you looked around, you'd see like this, this sea of rocks in your sky. Uh, and that is not the truth. Asteroids are small and the asteroid belt, even though that picture made it look like the asteroid belt was just thick with asteroids, they're very far apart. In fact, if you were out in the middle of the main asteroid belt right now, we'll give you a spacesuit so that you can look around and enjoy the experience, and looking around yourself you would see the night sky, okay? There would probably be no or maybe a couple of barely naked eye visible things in the sky that were asteroids and unless you had a star catalog in your head you wouldn't be able to tell which one of them were asteroids. So it's really a lot of empty space there. We've sent spacecraft through the main asteroid belt several times and the only ones that came near asteroids were the ones that we deliberately pointed to go by near asteroids. We haven't lost any ships because they ran into a rock out there. Particularly if you watch the right kinds of movies. There is an impression, this was big in Star Trek too, that um, space materials are weird. They might be green glowing crystals that rob Superman of his powers. Um, that's not true. 
Space materials are not weird. Um, we have a pretty good idea of what asteroids are made out of because every once in a while small ones hit the Earth and we call those meteorites. And we can pick those up and take them in the lab and cut them in half and see that they, darn, they look a lot like rocks. <laughs> so that's really what we're talking about. It's rocks. Unfortunately, not quite as exciting as what we get in science fiction. Now, there's some basic rock types that you should know about. Um, the first one I showed you there was an ordinary chondrite. That's the most common type of meteorite, and we think the most common type of asteroid, or at least the kind of asteroid that can uh, send pieces near to us here on Earth. Another type of asteroid is carbonaceous. It's uh, also a rock, but it's got a lot of black carbon in it. In fact, it looks like a charcoal briquette. This is one that my team and I found in Antarctica uh, a year and a half ago. Um, this is about a 10-pound meteorite, and this was one of the big, huge prizes of the, of the season that we found, and everybody was very excited and had to have their picture taken with it like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of the ones we find are a lot sm smaller than that. So this carbonaceous type of uh, meteorite and asteroid is another important type to know. And then finally, um, found rather more commonly on Earth than in space are irons. Some asteroids, some meteoroids are chunks of iron. Uh, when these land on Earth, they tend to uh, last a long time before weathering destroys them. Farmers plow them up in their fields in the Midwest, and they can immediately tell that this is no ordinary rock. And so they're misrepresented in our samples on Earth. We see more of them on Earth than there really are up in the sky. And these are actual chunks of, of nickel iron. So, that's the basics. Now let's talk about what happens if one of these things hits us. So uh, about a year and a half ago, in the city of Chelyabinsk, Russia, the residents awoke to found, find an object brighter than the sun moving across their sky with a big, huge angular rate. So if you ever see something like that, brighter than the sun, and the shadows of the lampposts are doing this, something bad is about to happen. <laughs> Now, this, this light appeared in the sky, and it left a big sort of smoke trail in the air. There were some people who thought they were under attack. Um, it detonated in the upper atmosphere, and everybody was out there going, oh, wow, look at that, or at the window, wow, look at that. And then about one minute later, the shock wave hit. Now, the detonation of this was like a um, moderate-sized nuclear weapon, and the shock wave, when it hit the ground, basically blew out every window in the city. About 1,500 people were hospitalized with injuries from flying glass, and thank goodness no one was killed. So uh, Russia is not just unlucky, it's really big. Um, back in 1908, being big makes you a big target. Back in 1908, there was a larger airburst over an uninhabited part of Russia um, in Siberia called, around the Tunguska River, and it flattened several hundred square miles of forest from that blast wave. All the trees laying out away from the center and the ones right under the center still standing up but with all their branches stripped off. And then of course there was the dino killer. Uh, back in 1980, uh, uh, an astronomer and a geologist pieced together some fragmentary evidence that looked like the Earth got hit with something quite big, five, six, seven miles in diameter, 10 kilometers in uh, progressive California units. And it did enough damage to the Earth's biosphere from shockwave, tsunami, earthquake, lofted dust into the stratosphere, re-entering ejecta coming into the atmosphere and heating up the whole world so that all the forests lit on fire, et cetera, et cetera, making the oceans as acidic as battery acid. Very bad. No species of animal with a body weight over 50 pounds made it through that. And there was a lot of resistance to this idea. Um, back in 1980, geology was comfortable with the idea that things changed gradually and there weren't these catastrophes where suddenly everything changed. But, you know, we should have known better even by 1980 because by then we'd gotten a good look at some of our neighbor planets. And what do you see? We look at the moon, its craters, its craters on top of craters. You look at Mercury, craters everywhere. Mars, it's had some uh, erosion and geologic processes to erase old craters, still has a lot of craters. Venus with an atmosphere that's as thick as our ocean at 3,000 feet, still punching through that thick atmosphere, things big enough to make good-sized craters. Everywhere we go, 
we see that things are just totally covered with craters. They've been pummeled by asteroid impacts. What makes us think we're special? The answer is we're not. So this could happen someday. It would be a bad time. But how worried do we need to be? And this is a tough question, and uh, our 30 best minds in asteroid science uh, that are here are still working with the best way to, to assess and manage risks like this. But let's talk about what we know for starters. So something the size of a meteorite, the size of a baseball, without much kinetic energy, in fact, by the time it gets through even the, the thin upper atmosphere, it's lost its high speed from being in space and would fall to the ground just as fast as a normal rock dropped off a building. And we get hit with those about, on average, about once a minute. Now, the Earth is big. Most of them go in the ocean, and not all of them are recognized and so on. So we don't have quite that many in our collection, but about once a minute. Something the size of the Chelyabinsk impactor, 50 feet in diameter, impact energy of 440 kilotons. I am told that a, a fair to Midland class uh, nuclear weapon is about 750 kilotons. So this is, a, this is a nuclear bomb. We think one of those hits us about every 100 years. And remember, this is random. So if you have bad luck, you could get two on the same day. This is the average interval. <laughs> Tunguska-sized impactor, 50 meters in diameter. So impact energy of 10 megatons, getting up to the size of the largest nuclear weapons ever detonated in tests. Average time between those guys hitting us about once every 3,000 years. Then we start getting up to the big stuff. An asteroid impact big enough to end civilization. So this is something that would hit the Earth, throw enough dust into the stratosphere to darken the planet. You wouldn't get a summer that day. You wouldn't get a harvest that year. And who here has a year's worth of food in their pantry? <laughs> Not me. So, um, and there's a lot of people in the world who don't have even a day's worth of food in their pantry. And when people get hungry, they um, get impolite. And that would probably bring civilization down. The energy of that guy is 10 to the sixth megatons, that is 1 million one megaton weapons all going off at once. Fortunately, that only happens every million years. And the dino killers at 10 kilometers, 100 million megatons of explosive energy about every 100 million years. And it's just hard to wrap your head around numbers like that. Terrible, terrible catastrophes kills everybody in the world every million years. How do you balance that against other risks in life? So there's a way to do that. And somebody else did all this math for me. so. But I'm going to show it. And they have calculated the average number of deaths per year we expect worldwide from asteroids. And it's about 100. Now you say, well, nobody got killed last year or the year before that. What up? So on average, it's 100. Most years, it's zero. But occasionally, you have a very bad year, and a lot of people die. <laughs> Still kind of hard to wrap your head around in terms of risk. So let's compare it to a couple other things. Um, sharks worldwide kill about five people. So if you saw the movie Jaws and didn't want to go in the water, you should be really more worried about asteroids, because on average, it's a bigger risk. <laughs> and if you live in Houston like I do, and you go outside when it's thundering, you shouldn't care anything about asteroids, because lightning kills way more people on average every year than asteroids do. So. Speaking of Houston, in Houston, we, and, and I speak of Houston often and rarely in good terms. Um, in Houston, we have these natural disasters called hurricanes. Um, you guys have earthquakes here. The picture of a hurricane from orbit is awesome. A picture of an earthquake from orbit is just dumb. So, so I showed the hurricane. So how do we handle hurricanes in Houston? Well, if you remember the Hurricane Rita evacuation, we handled them very badly. Um, but for Ike, after we learned all the bad lessons after we killed 120 people evacuating the whole city of Houston for a uh, hurricane that then missed the city, um, for Hurricane Ike, we did better. So how do we handle a hurricane? We manage it. So we see it coming. People stock up on food. They make evacuation plans. They open all the freeway lanes going one direction out of the city. Um, they evacuate especially the low-lying areas that they know are susceptible to storm surge. People board up their windows. They get stores of food and water. They get standby generators, extra flashlight batteries. Then after the storm, they've got trucks uh, just inside of the destruction, or just outside of the destruction zone filled with gasoline and water and food ready to come in. They get electrical line crews from neighboring states to come in and repair all the power lines. But we don't do anything about the hurricane itself. We manage the disaster. We cannot do anything about the disaster itself, only our own response to it. But what would it be like 
if you could just make that not happen. No hurricane. That would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? And in fact, you might think we would want to actually do that because hurricanes cause billions of dollars in damage. And as it turns out, we can do something about asteroid impacts. We can make the disaster not happen. But the key to that is warning time. You've got to see it coming. That's one reason, by the way, that hurricanes are better than earthquakes. We know the hurricane is coming two days away. You don't know when the earthquake's coming. Warning time is key. Right now, for most asteroids that could cause uh, um, a city to sustain a lot of damage, the first warning you get is there's a big bright thing in the sky in the shadow of the lamppost is doing this. <laughs> and that warning time then is zero. In the case of Chelyabinsk, they didn't know until the sky lit up. We have actually had a couple of cases in the last few years where we've detected a small asteroid just before it hit the atmosphere with a few hours of warning. But that's where we are right now. Zero to a few hours of warning, which isn't time to do anything to stop the disaster. And the reason for that is we think that out there in our solar system are about 100,000 near-Earth asteroids that are bigger than about 140 meters. And this is sort of a line that the uh, community has drawn. We think that a 140-meter asteroid hitting a city would pretty much destroy the city. Now, that airburst would knock down buildings and kill a lot of people. Um, smaller than that, it might not be such a big disaster. Bigger than that, it's a huge problem. Of those near-Earth asteroids, we've only found about 10%. For the potentially hazardous ones, that means ones that really do come very close to the Earth's orbit and are that big, we think there's about 20,000 of those out there, of which we found about 6%, and the remaining 94% remain undiscovered. And we cannot predict their arrival until we find them and get their orbits. Now, Congress has instructed us by 2020 to have found 90% of the potentially hazardous <laughs> asteroids. That's kind of soon now. They made, a, they made this instruction a while ago, and actually we're making really good progress. Uh, we, we may possibly get there. New instruments are coming online. Um, they did not, however, send any extra money with this <laughs> order. They just said, go find them. OK, thanks. We're doing our best. And we really are doing our best, because the total number of people working now to identify asteroids, plot their orbits, find out whether they could pose a threat to the Earth is the same number of people it takes to staff one McDonald's restaurant. <laughs> now, Chelyabinsk was kind of a wake-up call. Gee, what if that had happened over a US city? And so Congress said, you know, maybe we should make this a little bit more of a priority in our funding. So now we have, <laughs> they, they doubled the funding for this so we have enough people to staff two McDonald's restaurants. So it's progress. We'll, we'll, we'll take what we can get. It's all good. So how do you do this? How do you find these asteroids? First, you need a telescope with a pretty big light bucket to collect a lot of photons from a little tiny object that's a long ways away. You need to have a big field of view so you can look at a wide area of sky and find these things. This is uh, one of the PanSTARRS telescopes on Mount Haleakala in Hawaii that is doing a lot of this really good work for us. With such a telescope, you take repetitive images of the night sky. The stars stay fixed. The asteroids move because they're in orbit around the sun. And you can discover them on photographs like this. This is an old picture. The new techniques are getting better and better. Um, and we heard about some of those this week at the workshop that I'm attending. Once you have plotted it out and see where it is on the sky, you can actually plot the orbit of it to see how it goes around the sun. And once you have the orbit, you've kind of got it nailed. Remember, these things are like planets. The orbit of the Earth goes around the sun in an exquisitely predictable way. And we know right where the Earth is going to be way out into the future. It's a little tougher for asteroids because they can cross the orbits of the planets and maybe get close to a planet. But once you've got the orbit on an asteroid, you've kind of got it for the next 100 years. You know where it's going to be for the next 100 years. Um, but after that, you know, the gravity of the planets is always stirring the pot and tweaking the orbits a little bit. But you've got it for 100 years once you've got the orbit. And that means you have warning time of decades. And with warning time of decades, we can do something. Now, <laughs> if an asteroid is uh, on a collision course with the Earth, we have two basic ways of dealing with it. One, we can try to deflect it 
like Admiral Akbar here. Or you can blow it up. Now, this picture is blurry, but I chose it for a reason because this is one of my very favorite stories in the whole world. Um, and this is a picture from a television tape from the year 1970 when uh, on the coast of Oregon, not far from where I grew up in Eugene, there's a little town called Florence, about 2,000 people. And one day, a dead whale washed up on the beach at Florence, Oregon. And it smelled really bad. And the sea breezes were blowing the stench of this dead whale into this town. The town lives on tourist dollars. It was causing a problem with the economy. It was making all the residents sick. So they started complaining to the state, please do something about the stinky dead whale. So the state thought about this for a minute, and then they, <laughs> they sent the highway department to deal with the whale. And the highway department looked at the problem, and they said, well, the whale is too big to tow back out to sea. It's too big for us to bury with bulldozers, so we're just gonna stuff it with dynamite and <laughs> blow it up. And when the whale is in small pieces, then the seagulls and the crabs will do what the seagulls and crabs do, and they'll take care of it, which the seagulls and crabs were working on it, but it was a big whale, it was gonna take a long time. So that's how we're going to deal with this problem. So they stuffed the whale with dynamite. They had TV crews out there and a lot of spectators wanting to see the whale blow up. <laughs> and they blew up the whale. And shortly thereafter, bits of stinking blubber began raining out of the heavens. <laughs> and the spectators were ducking as all this stuff is splatting down all around them. And when they got back to the parking lot. <laughs> OK, I wish I was making this up. <laughs> But this really happened. This guy's car got totaled by a thousand pound piece of blubber falling from the sky and destroying his car. Isn't that cool? So, so I tell this story not just because it's funny and one of my favorite stories, but there's a reason behind it. If you are going to blow up something offensive, you have to make darn sure there are no big pieces. So in a more serious way, a one kilometer asteroid has within it eight 500 meter asteroids. It goes as the cube of the diameter. So if you're gonna blow up an asteroid, the last thing you want is to turn a bullet into eight slightly smaller bullets, each of which can do a lot of damage. And that means if you wanna make very sure that there are no big pieces, you gotta blow it up really good, really thoroughly, and make sure you get it blown into small pieces. That gets harder because we think that a lot of asteroids are not solid rocks, like Ayers Rock tumbling through space, as you might get the idea from if you watch too many movies, but piles of rubble, gravel, boulders, and cobbles just held together by their own super weak self-gravity. But what do we use to stop bullets? Sandbags. Granular media with lots of interfaces between different grains and sizes of stuff are, is just excellent at absorbing kinetic energy and shock damage. So these asteroids are much tougher than a solid rock when it comes to blowing them up. So that makes the problem even harder than just blowing up the solid rock, because now you've got to blow up something and get it into very small pieces that is really good at absorbing that kind of damage. And what all that means is that if you want to blow up the asteroid compared to deflecting it, it takes three times more energy on the target. And that usually means three times the cost. And when you go in front of Congress and say, we want to do this, and we have two ways, one of which costs three times more than the other, I'll tell you which one they're going to fund. So sorry, Mr. Willis. We're not going to blow it up. We're going to deflect it. Now. This has gotten a bigger laugh here at Caltech than at any other place I've ever <laughs> shown this slide. Okay, so if you have made up your mind that you're gonna push on this asteroid to get it off of a collision course with the Earth, the direction of the push matters quite a lot. So for an object in orbit around the sun, I've drawn a little diagram here, totally not to scale. Most asteroid uh, orbits are ellipses, not circles, but I made it a circle for simplicity. Let's say we have an asteroid on an orbit around the sun. And we have several different choices of direction to push it. One of them is radial. That is pushing directly away from the sun on this thing as it tracks around the sun. When you push radially, radially on something, give a little nudge, 
you'll push it onto a new orbit that looks like this. It tracks away from the original orbit until it's gone about a quarter of the way around and then it comes back and crosses the original orbit, comes inside it about a quarter of the way around and then back to the original starting point. And it will continue doing that basically forever. So what you've done, if this bullet is coming at you, decades in the future, so it's going to make many revs of the sun, and we push it radially, all it's going to do is wobble a little tiny bit back and forth, but basically stay on track. And if you're very unlucky, it hasn't moved at all when it gets to you. So radial is not a good choice. All we did was put a little wobble on this bullet. Another possibility is out of plane. Now that circular orbit, we've tipped it on its side, so you're looking at the hula hoop edge on. The asteroid is tracking around the sun on this circle, seen edge on like a, like a P on the uh, edge of a phonograph record. There are people in here who remember phonograph records, aren't there? <laughs> okay. Um, we give it a little push here, and what that does is it puts it on a new orbit that's inclined a little bit from the old one. It tracks away from the old orbit until it gets about a quarter of the way around and then it comes back, crosses the old orbit, comes below the old orbit and just does that. Now, same thing, the bullet's coming at us, it's got to go around the sun ten times before it gets to us because the collision's ten years out in the future. I give it a little push up and it's just going to wobble up and down just a teeny little bit around its original course and never get very far away from its original course and if we have bad luck and we're halfway around the sun from where we pushed, we get no effect at all. Also not a good choice. That leaves us with one more option. It better be a good one. We're going to push tangentially. That is, this thing's on its orbit around the sun and we're going to either hustle it along a little bit in its orbit, push it ahead in its orbit, or retard it, slow it down in its orbit a little bit. In this illustration, I've drawn it pushing along the direction of the orbit and what that does is it puts the asteroid on a new orbit that this time takes it out further from the sun and then comes back. And I hear you say, well, look, it just came back to its original point. But there's an important difference here. An orbit that is bigger takes longer to go around. So when we give it one little push, the asteroid will come around on this bigger orbit. It'll come right back to its starting point, but it will get there late compared to when it would have been there otherwise. The second time around, I don't even have to push it again. It goes around in this bigger orbit and now it arrives twice as late. I haven't touched it again. Third time around, three times as late. And that delay will keep adding up basically forever. I've given it one push and with each rev around the sun it gets more and more of a delay. So what we're going to do is we're going to push on our asteroid, put it on a new orbit that takes either longer to go around the sun or it works if it takes less time too. And we will make it arrive late for its date with the Earth. So it will go right through where the Earth was a few hours ago. And that's good enough to make it miss the planet and that is what we're going to do. Now all it takes, if you have about ten years of warning on an asteroid strike, is a change in velocity of that asteroid which is going around the sun at 30 kilometers per second of just one centimeter per second. That's all it takes or if there are any Texans in the audience, .02 <laughs> in, in real man units, .02 miles per hour. All right, so this is a cool idea and a lot of people are interested in it and there have been many, many, many different ideas proposed for how to put that one centimeter per second delta V onto an asteroid to prevent it from hitting the Earth. And everybody wants to save the Earth which is good and there's this amazing array of ideas and it's actually kind of bewildering but fortunately a lot of people uh, smarter than me on this have gotten together and written a report and here it is and there's the link, uh, National Research Council uh, published this Defending Planet Earth where they surveyed all of the um, proposed asteroid deflection methods and settled on their three favorites. They said these are our three best ones. And here they are and I'll talk about each one in turn. First of all, standoff nuclear blast. Where's the fun if you can't light off a nuke? <laughs> uh, especially for big objects or short warning times, this is our only option. This is the only way we have within our technological portfolio of putting enough push on an asteroid to deflect it at more or less the last minute. And this is a great picture, I think this is in x-rays of one of the early uh, nuclear bomb blasts. You don't blow the asteroid up, you don't tunnel into it, sorry Mr. Willis, 
You actually stand off maybe uh, a radius out from the surface, you light your bomb off, that pulse of radiation hits the asteroid, heats it up, boils it, and the reaction force of all the gas and debris boiling off the asteroid shoves it onto its new course. So the blast wave of the bomb really doesn't do it. It's the heat and radiation pulse boiling stuff off that gives you your reaction force. Very effective, and we could build it right now, but that means nukes in space. Now, I was working up at JPL when we launched Cassini. Cassini was a nuclear-powered spacecraft with radioisotope thermal generators, which is a block of plutonium dioxide that gets warm because it's radioactive, and some thermal ele electric converters turn that warmth into electricity. RTGs are really hard to hurt somebody with. If you beat someone over the head with it, you could probably hurt them, otherwise not. Despite this, we had protesters chaining themselves to the gates at Kennedy Space Center because we were putting nuclear things in space. Even worse than an RTG would be a nuclear reactor. There have been a few of those launched into space in the past, mostly by the Russians, um, and those would make a terrible outcry. Even worse than a reactor is a nuclear weapon. I believe there are people out there who would oppose the launch of a nuclear weapon into space, even if it was to save the Earth. <laughs> so there's political baggage with the nuclear option. So very effective political baggage. Next possibility, kinetic impactor. You build a small sacrificial spaceship and you basically put it out into space and let the asteroid run into it. It's going to hit it at eh, five, six-ish kilometers per second. The punch of the spacecraft going into the asteroid will provide a little kick on the asteroid. And then even more importantly, the debris kicked up out of that crater is going to provide a larger push, maybe even a factor of three larger than the spacecraft hitting the asteroid in the first place. And that's what provides the impulse to move the asteroid. But this, too, has uncertainty involved in it. This is a series of high-speed photographs of a hypervelocity impact onto a perfectly well-understood target in a laboratory on Earth. And it is still unclear to us exactly how much stuff comes out when you do an impact like this, and how fast, and at what angle, and with what mass. And if you're hitting a natural surface where you might hit a boulder or you might hit a big pond of dust, the uncertainty in how much reaction force you get from the liberated ejecta is pretty big. Maybe a factor of three uncertainty in how much push you're actually going to get from your spaceship. That means your spaceship has to be made extra big so that even if you are wrong in many ways about the ejecta, you still get enough to get the job done and push the asteroid off course. So you have to over-design your ship if you're going to use this method. And finally, the gravity tractor, which Joel mentioned, um, my personal favorite because um, I'm a co-inventor on it, so everything I say is totally unbiased and, and objective <laughs> about the gravity tractor. It's the best. Um, so in this idea, you build a spacecraft that flies up to the asteroid, gets either ahead of it or behind it in its orbit, and just hovers there. And over a long period of time, perhaps even as long as a year, the incredibly weak gravitational pull of the spacecraft on the asteroid will gradually tug the asteroid onto a new orbit. Super well controllable. You can point it exactly the way you want it. You don't have to over-design the spacecraft. The asteroid could be made out of hamsters for all you care. As long as it has mass, we can pull on it. We don't care about its rotation state. Um, but it's very, very weak. And most importantly, it takes a year to pull that impact point off the planet. And while you are pulling that projected impact point off the planet, you may have some political things to think about. So let's talk about this for a minute. Let's say we've discovered an asteroid that in 20 years is going to hit Chicago. And we've decided to send a gravity tractor out there to fix this problem. And the way the orbits work out, it turns out that if we hustle the asteroid ahead in its orbit, we're going to shift that impact point to the northeast and off the planet off the North Pole. Or we can slow the asteroid down in its orbit. That will pull the impact point in the opposite direction, maybe out into the Pacific where we think the tsunami will be manageable and it will cause a minimum of damage. So let's say we decide we're going to hustle the asteroid along in its orbit. And we make that plan and we publicize it. And the government of Canada then rings our phone. It says, so you're going to put this uh, ship up there and you're going to start dragging this impact point. What happens if your ship breaks right, and it's right there? <laughs> we don't like that. We think you should uh, slow the asteroid down. OK, we'll slow it down. Well, then we get a call from the Mexican government. So whenever you are moving impact points around in a, in a continuous and long-term way across the face of the Earth, you may be dragging them across somebody else's turf, and they may not like that. So all of these methods have their advantages and disadvantages, um, and not one is perfect, even the gravity tractor, 
oh well. <laughs> so fortunately, the, the NRC, um, in the end of their report, uh, sort of published a summary document as to where they think, what, what you ought to do depending on how big the asteroid is, really big ones, really small ones, how much warning time you have, one year, 100 years. If it's big or if you have short warning time, nuclear is your only option. Sort of mid-range stuff, the kinetic impactor is probably best. For smaller stuff, smaller than 75 meters or so, it's probably best to duck and cover or evacuate the target zone because um, that will be easier and cheaper than building a space mission. And way off here in the lonely little corner is a gravity tractor. <laughs> but I feel better because there are way more little asteroids than big ones. So the case we will have to do is probably down here. And once we have the orbits, an asteroid that we know its uh, position out one year in advance has only one chance to get us. But if we know its orbit out 100 years, it has 100 chances to get us. So the odds of detecting an impact go up the further out into the future you use. So actually, I think our chances of actually building the tractor are good. The best possible outcome would be, of course, that we never find anything that's going to hit the Earth and we never have to do anything. But it's possible we'll get to use a tractor someday. All right. Um, some of my office mates have gone off to get um, MBAs. Um, th thinking about jobs in the future uh, after the astronaut office, and they come back with all these great sayings like, every threat is also an opportunity. <laughs> okay, well, sometimes, you know, I've been uh, studying and teaching martial arts for many years now, and sometimes a threat is just an opportunity to get your butt kicked, but okay, <laughs> that's putting a nice positive spin on it, and perhaps good things can come out of it, and actually asteroids are a case where a threat is also an opportunity in particular, an opportunity to send people out to asteroids. Now, the same orbital characteristics that make asteroids a threat to the Earth, that is, they come close to the Earth, have orbits similar to the Earth's, that also means that we can get to them with rockets in a reasonable length of time, with a reasonable amount of fuel, and maybe send people there. This is the orbit of 433 Eros that was visited by a robot spacecraft um, and is also one of the largest of the near-Earth asteroids. In, on the policy end of things, we've heard from our uh, great chiefs in Washington that the moon is passé, been there, done that. So I put a check mark on it, check that box, except I made the check mark red for a reason. Uh, just planting a flag is not enough. The first folks at the South Pole of the Earth were Norwegians. They had an awesome expedition, didn't lose a man, they planted the flag, they left. There is a base at the South Pole of the Earth now, and if you go to the lunch counter and order in Norwegian, you will not get any food. <laughs> because the people in that base are mostly Americans and they don't speak Norwegian. <laughs> the point being that just planting the flag and leaving does not make you a, a, a tenant of a place. You have to move in if you really want to be an owner. So, I think planting the flag and leaving is not a good choice. There's also a very solid understanding now that getting to Mars is really, really hard. <laughs> I have another talk on that that I could give you some time if you like. Um, so somewhere between the been there, done that, and the really, really hard, maybe asteroids are an intermediate step that we could manage. As in this picture here, Maybe we could send our new Orion spacecraft out not too far from the Earth. Actually, this is very frighteningly close to the Earth. <laughs> it's a good artist picture, though. And send some people out there and do some exploring of a new place, which would be kind of cool. So what a mission like that might look like is we take our new heavy lift rocket that's being designed down in Marshall Space Space Flight Center as we speak. We launch a great big Earth departure stage with a big engine and a lot of fuel and an empty Orion crew capsule. That goes up into low Earth orbit. Later on, we launch our crew in a second Orion capsule up to low Earth orbit. We meet our departure stage. We burn all that gas. We cruise on out to our asteroid with our two uh, Orion spacecraft. And there's probably going to be two people. And each of those spacecraft is about the same size as a minivan. And you're going to spend three months in there, which is going to yeah, it'll be OK. We, I think we can manage that. Um, when you arrive near the asteroid, you have to burn all the gas in one of these Orions to catch up with it, match orbits with it. You have a few days to explore the asteroid, and then you have to come home, burn all the gas in the second Orion. That sends you back to Earth, takes you about three months to cruise, and now you're only in one minivan. Re-enter the atmosphere and land on your parachutes. Drawn another way, this is sort of a perspective view of the trajectories. You fly out from Earth, you meet an oncoming asteroid, 
that you discovered years ago. You ride with the asteroid for a few days, then you burn your engines to depart it and come back home. But exploring an asteroid with people is not going to be like exploring the moon. This is an example of a fairly hefty near-Earth asteroid. This is Itokawa. And it's about 500 meters across, which is not all that much bigger than our International Space Station, which is about 100 meters across, which means that when you get to a near-Earth asteroid, you are not going to land. There is essentially no gravity at all on this thing, not enough that you could notice, not enough to uh, bring a spacecraft down. You'd have to use your thrusters to land. And then if you just touched it, you would go drifting away. So you're not going to land. Instead, you're going to dock. So this is a, a, a European robot cargo ship preparing to dock with the space station, this artist conception. Now, when we dock with the space station, we dock with this. This is our docking adapter. It's a nice engineered ring with sensors that tell you when you've touched it and metal guides that lock you into the correct orientation and an optical target that can tell you in roll, pitch, and yaw where you are within a half a degree in every axis and these nice little hooks that are exactly machined with tolerances of a uh, fraction of a millimeter to meet up with hooks on the arriving spacecraft and hold the two things together once they've met. And this is what we dock with. If we go to an asteroid, we're going to dock with this. <laughs> This is not engineered. We don't know if these boulders are sitting there or embedded. So attaching to this asteroid, and not bouncing off when we touch it, is going to be a challenge. And it's like nothing we've ever done. Another problem is when you approach an asteroid with some speed and you decide you want to slow down and stop so that you don't hit it at that speed, you must fire a thruster. There's no other way to slow down in space. And when you fire a thruster, the plume of that thruster goes off in the direction that you're traveling because you're slowing down. And you may kick up some dust, as the pilot of this Osprey is going to have to deal with very shortly here. And it would be nice to see when you do this docking with this unprepared surface. Next, anchoring. Easy on Earth. Gravity is a big help. But if you want to attach to an asteroid, say you want to do a spacewalk on it, drill into it, you're going to have to figure out a way to hold yourself onto it. But even grabbing a rock, if you put any upforce on it, you may just go drifting away with the rock. This is extra hard because we don't know from first principles whether the material on the surface of an asteroid is as broken up and fluffy as styrofoam peanuts or half dome, <laughs> completely solid granite. And of course, uh, we're not going to go all that way unless we are planning to get out of the car. So we're probably going to want to do a spacewalk on an asteroid if we get there. This is an astronaut leaving the hatch on the International Space Station. No, it's not me. Um, and I want to draw your attention to these friendly yellow objects here. These are handrails. And when you're on a spacewalk, you don't go anywhere where there's not handrails. <laughs> That's how we stay attached to the space station. If you should find yourself moving away from the station, you can just pull the handrail, and you'll come right back. Very nice. We like those things. On an asteroid, you find yourself drifting away, you grab a rock, and you go drifting away with a rock. <laughs> so no handrails. And we'll have to figure out techniques for um, allowing people to move around on an asteroid, stabilize their bodies. One possibility is you um, get a big fishing net, wrap the whole thing in the net, and crawl around on the net. This is the surface. This is sort of a close-up of the asteroid Itokawa, just showing how jumbled and messy that surface is. Very challenging environment to try to crawl around in weightlessness. And then, of course, on the small scale, when you're doing a spacewalk, you don't want to cover your helmet visor with dust, because then you can't see where you're going. So not to say that this is impossible, but there are some technical problems that we're going to have to solve if we send humans to asteroids. One of the places that we're working on solutions for those is uh, here at uh, Nemo, there's an underwater habitat in the Florida Keys, 40 feet down, that we send teams of astronauts down to live for a couple of weeks. Every day they do scuba dives. And um, in this example, they're actually deploying a model of a geophysical instrument for an asteroid mission in a weightless environment using this little submarine, which has an extra person piloting it inside, as a proxy for a little spacecraft that might hold onto the feet of an, asteroid, uh, an astronaut and help them move around an asteroid so that they don't have to touch it to move around which is kind of a cool concept. 
So if you don't want to go all the way out to an asteroid and you'd like it to be in a little more controlled situation when you get it back, you can instead send a robot out to grab a whole small asteroid in, in this concept that the Keck Institute publicized about a year and a half ago now, I think, two years. You uh, secure the bag around the asteroid, spend a couple years driving back to a high orbit around the Earth's moon where you dock a, an Orion spacecraft with crew to that robot ship and then have your astronauts climb out, open up the bag, and see what Santa brought. <laughs> We've been working on uh, concepts for this, too, including in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, our giant swimming pool down at Johnson Space Center, where we practice spacewalks. This is our simulated asteroid rubble pile here. It's just a bag of gravel. Um, most of these are just rocks, so they nicely stay in here, but the engineers made some neutrally buoyant rocks for us. So when you open up the bag and, and start manipulating stuff, some of these things start crawling out like little fish, and you're trying to get them down or put them in a bag. Um, <clears throat> and in this particular neutral buoyancy lab run, we've got our, our simulated asteroid, our simulated bag. We uh, practice with a cutting tool um, that is so cleverly designed that even an astronaut can't get their glove finger into it. <laughs> and these orange suits, are the spacesuits that we may use for the first couple of Orion flights. They're based on the old space shuttle launch and entry suit. OK. There's also opportunities from asteroids for science and resources. So let's talk about that for just a few minutes. We think that asteroids are leftover pieces of planets that we're not able to collect to form a planet. Um, maybe by the gravity of Jupiter, which we think formed early among the planets of the solar system, and stirred up the speeds of things in the asteroid belt so that they couldn't clump together to form planets. Because these, these rocks never were formed into a planet, uh, many of them never melted to form a crust and a mantle and a core like the Earth and the terrestrial planets have, they contain materials that are essentially unchanged since the earliest history of the solar system. And they tell us a lot about how the Earth first came to be, and they can tell us a lot about what the early sun was like, where comets came from, where the gas giant, how the gas giant planets developed. Lots and lots of scientifically interesting stuff there. Now, we can already learn a fair amount about that from studying meteorites. This is another little carbonaceous meteorite in its, uh, where it was found in, on the ice in Antarctica. But there's a problem with meteorites. They've all had to go through the atmosphere. Now, things get hot going through the atmosphere, but that only affects the outer few millimeters of the rock. That heat pulse is very brief, and it doesn't boil the inside. It just scorches the outside. So the heat is not the problem. The problem is when a rock hits the Earth's atmosphere at 18 kilometers per second, it undergoes many hundreds of Gs of deceleration, and that's enough to crush a lot of rocks. And if they're very weak rocks, they come to pieces entirely in the upper atmosphere and don't even reach the ground. And we got kind of a reminder about this recently. Um, uh, a fireball was sighted over northern British Columbia. Uh, they saw it break up. Um, they went scattering out over the winter snow on the frozen lakes there. Uh, you know, it's up by Alaska and the Yukon to find the meteorite. And many of the pieces of the meteorite had fallen on the snow on a frozen lake. And this is what they looked like. It was crumbly black stuff that would just come apart in your hand. And if it had landed in the summer, of course, it would have sunk in the lake. But anything that landed on the dirt would have been indistinguishable from dirt. We might never have found this meteorite. There were a couple of large, solid pieces. But there might be a lot of this stuff out there. And this stuff, since it's uncompacted, is probably the best example of the pristine stuff that the planets formed from. And we may not have very much of it at all here on Earth because of the atmospheric filter. We'd have to go out into space to find this stuff. So science is fun. But when it comes to opening frontiers, with the exception of Antarctica, which is a purely scientific endeavor, you cannot beat something worth going for. So this is a picture of the uh, Chilkoot Pass during the Alaska Gold Rush, all these people lining up to climb up over this snowy pass to get up into the Yukon to find gold. Most of them didn't. <laughs> I hear the shopkeepers made, got rich, but most of the miners didn't. And an example closer to home, this is uh, San Francisco in the late 1840s. Nothing like a valuable resource to open up a frontier. If we want to open up the frontier of space, that's what'll do it. It won't be science. It'll be economics that does it. 
So if you want to get valuable things out of an asteroid, you have some tasks ahead of you. First, you have to get out into space and rendezvous with the asteroid, maybe with a robot, maybe with people. Rendezvousing is hard, but we've done it. We've had two spacecraft go out and match courses with an asteroid and fly along with it around the sun. Once you've rendezvoused, you need to land. That's hard, too, but we've done it twice, the near spacecraft at Eros and the Hayabusa spacecraft at Itakawa. Both successfully landed on their target asteroids. Now, if you want to do any mining operations, things get more complicated. We've been learning about this this week. If you want to manipulate the asteroid, you probably have to attach to it somehow. And anchoring is quite hard. We don't have a good solution for this yet. Maybe put the thing in a net, maybe drill in with augers. But remember, even an auger that like drills into soft sand, it only has holding power because of the weight of the sand on the auger. If there's no weight, you just pull it right up as soon as you apply a force onto the asteroid. And finally, drilling. We don't really know how to do that at all. <laughs> <laughs> if you decide you need to tunnel into this thing, extremely difficult. So the mining techniques that we've been using on Earth are probably going to have to mutate quite a bit for us to use them on asteroids. So let's say you go to all this trouble. You fly to the asteroid, you land on it, you attach, you drill, you find out ways to manipulate this material. Remember, it's a rock. And meteorites are not full of gold or anything. What do you get for your trouble? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. One is platinum, the iron meteorite that I showed you a picture of early in the talk. If that were on Earth, that would be commercial ore grade for platinum. Okay, Most of the platinum on the Earth, by the way, is mixed with iron. It, it mixes with iron like vinegar mixes with water, and it's down in the core. We only have a little bit left up here on the crust. So these, leftover, these bits of cores of asteroids are not bad for platinum ore. But even platinum is not worth as much as it might cost for you to go out and get it. But I think there might be a way around that. So these jewels and heirlooms here were made in the late 1890s out of a fabulously rare and expensive metal called aluminum. <laughs> okay, when aluminum first came out, it took a tremendous amount of electrical power to turn the ore into the metal. And there was hardly any of the metal. And it was vastly expensive. Of course, now you know we make soda cans and airplanes and stuff out of it. Um, but it was incredibly rare and valuable. And people dolled it up and paid top dollar for it just because it was expensive. For no other reason. It's not even particularly beautiful. It's aluminum. <laughs> so maybe platinum that came from outer space might sell for a premium, and I bet you there's people who would buy it. Another treasure that we could get from asteroids is water. Huh? So some of those meteorites do contain maybe up to 10 or 20 percent, weight percent water locked up in the molecules that make its rocks. Water is actually a wonderful thing to have in space. Split it up. And you've got oxygen. If we're doing anything with people in space, oxygen in space will be a very valuable thing to have, especially if you don't have to bring it from Earth. You can also keep the hydrogen as well as the oxygen, and you've got the world's best rocket fuel. This is a space shuttle main engine that burns uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Anything that you can make in space and then use in space is much more valuable than you might think. Because right now, anything that we use in space has to be launched from Earth in a rocket. But if you can make it in space, you don't have to buy one of these. And one of these costs $100 million once, and you throw it away. And then you have, if you want another one, you have to buy a new one. And what that means is anything you can make in space at all, oxygen, water, any old thing, if it's useful, it's worth about $10,000 per pound. If you can make it near the moon for use near the moon, it's worth $100,000 per pound. And now we're talking the price of platinum may be worth a gold rush. We will find out in the next few years. And with that frontier opening up, if there enough value can be found there, I think that's what's going to make a picture like this possible. Making and using things with resources in space will take us from a society that makes things on Earth and throws them out into, a space, into space into a society that actually lives and works in space. So to wrap up, near-Earth asteroids, 
They're little crater-battered, irregular worlds with no atmosphere. There's a lot of them, and some of them have orbits that cross the Earth. If one hit the Earth, it would be bad. <laughs> but we have the technology right now to prevent that from happening. We think that someday we'll send people to asteroids. That could start happening in as little as 10 years. We can learn wonderful things about the history of the solar system from studying uh, asteroids and meteorites. And someday we may have a space-based economy from resources on asteroids that will really make us an interplanetary civilization rather than just a single planet species. And that's all I have to tell you. And I'll be happy to take your questions.